Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is Bleeding for Spain, Partisans Part 6. This series, Partisans, which was created by myself and Stuart Redden, looks at Irish stories from the Spanish Civil War. And in this episode, things really heat up. The last show saw several hundred Irish people arrive in Spain in December 1936 to fight in the Spanish Civil War. This podcast follows them into some of the most important battles of the entire war. This podcast is supported by listeners like you, who support the show at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Patrons who fund the research also receive bonus content. At the moment, they have early access to ad-free episodes and an exclusive bonus series on life in medieval Ireland. You can get this and support my work at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. You can also support the show by checking out my new shop at irishhistorypodcast.ie shop. I've added lots of great items there, including flags from the Spanish Civil War, enamel badges of Irish historical figures, and a new range of gifts made from pewter that make for lovely presents. You can find out more at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. Research for this episode, and indeed the whole series Partisans, was by Stuart Redden. This show also uses additional research by Sam McGrath. Narrations are by Aidan Crow. Now to the 1930s. At Christmas 1936, the Dublin woman, Sarah Wood, was beside herself with worry. A few weeks previously, she had received a note from her son Tommy, just 17 years of age, that read, I am very sorry for not telling you where I was going. I'm going to Spain to fight with the International Column. Please forgive me for not letting you know. I left a message to be delivered on Sunday. We are going out to fight for the working class. It is not a religious war. By the time Sarah read the note, Tommy was on his way to Spain and there was little she could do to stop him. However, Sarah had some sense of the dangers her son now faced. While the Spanish Civil War was among the most romanticised conflicts in the 20th century, Sarah Wood had few illusions about the realities of war. She had lost two brothers within six weeks of each other during the Irish War of Independence. One was hanged in Mountjoy Jail and the other killed in an IRA attack on the Customs House in Dublin. Desperate to do something to save her son a similar fate, she contacted the Department of Foreign Affairs in the hope they could track him down and bring him back to Ireland. However, she had little idea exactly how much danger her young son Tommy was already in. Indeed, when he had crossed the Spanish frontier in mid-December, Tommy, or indeed few of the Irish anti-fascists, had any sense of just how quickly events would escalate for them. Once over the Spanish border, they had made their way to Albacete, where the international brigades were based and where their training was supposed to take place. This training was badly needed. Tommy, like the vast majority of Irish volunteers, had no experience of conventional warfare. His experiences in the Fianna, the youth wing of the IRA, was of little use. However, the situation that Christmas was very grave in anti-fascist Spain. Attacks were continuing around the city of Madrid and, to the south in Andalusia, the fascists were pushing up through the province of Cordoba. So it was, ill-prepared and inexperienced as he was, Tommy and several of the Irish volunteers were sent on their first mission after just two weeks in Spain. They were temporarily assigned to serve with the 14th International Brigade, comprised of Belgian and French anti-fascists. This unit was being dispatched to Andalusia to repel what was ultimately a relatively small offensive there. A few days later, they were involved in bitter fighting around the town of La Pera, and it was here whatever romantic notions Tommy had about war evaporated in what was a terrifying conflict in the unfamiliar terrain of olive groves. The Dublin communist Don O'Reilly penned a vivid account of the battle. We moved through the olive grove with the zing-zang of the bullets playing a tune. Occasionally a snick as a bullet clips off a cluster of leaves. Out from the friendly trees, down a short valley, crossing a stream, then up, up among the hills. We move to the crest. The fire is terrific. Joe Monks is hit. Prendergast and Dinny Cody's guns are shot to pieces. Bits of guns fly. And, and we think we are all hit. The mortal danger they were all in was all too apparent on December the 29th, when Tommy Wood, still only 17 years of age, was shot in the knee. Two other Irish anti-fascists picked him up, but while they carried him to safety, they came under sustained machine gun fire and Tommy was shot again, this time in the head. However, he remained conscious and made it to hospital. Back on the battlefield, despite appalling casualties, 
the 14th International Brigade had managed to hold the town of La Pera, and the Irish, despite their lack of experience, had fought well. However, it was very obvious, after what was ultimately a minor battle, that the Spanish Civil War was not going to be like anything the Irish had experienced before. Several volunteers had already been killed, but in many ways the worst news came after the battle had ended. Initially, when his friends asked after Tommy Wood in hospital, the news had been positive. However, in a cruel turn of events, it emerged somewhere along the way. His name had been lost in translation, and the hospital staff had thought they were inquiring after a Dutch anti-fascist called Wools. Tommy Wood had in fact died from his injuries, only 17 years of age. This underscored the fact that ideology, a belief in their cause or age, provided little by way of protection. If they were going to defeat fascism in Spain, it was going to come at a terrible price. There was no rhyme or reason as to who died or how they were killed. This lesson would be repeated time and again in the coming months. However devastating as this loss was, there was little time to reflect on the death of Tommy Wood. Not long after they rejoined the rest of the Irish volunteers at their training centre of Albacete, the entire Irish unit faced a much more stern task than they had at La Pera. In February, the fascists launched a major offensive around Madrid and the international brigades were sent into the breach. As we saw in the last episode, a siege of sorts had started around Madrid in late October 1936. While the fascists had captured large amounts of territory to the north and west of the city, they had not fully encircled Madrid, leaving supply lines open to the south and east. This partially explained why they had failed to take the city in late 1936. However, in February 1937, the fascist leader, General Franco, began to plan a major offensive. This took the form of two major attacks simultaneously. To the northeast of Madrid, an Italian force sent by the fascist dictator Benito Mussolini would push south across the Guadalajara River. At the same time, over 300 kilometres to the south, a joint force of Moroccans, Spanish and Germans would push eastwards across the Jarama, seizing the Valencia Road. If everything went according to plan, the two pincers would meet up to the east of Madrid and the city would be cut off from the outside world. It would have to capitulate sooner or later. Theoretically sound, the attack got off to a terrible start when the Italians were delayed in taking up their positions on the Guadalajara River. Rather than delay, Franco decided to push ahead with the Harama offensive to the south of Madrid. This would become the bloodiest encounter of the entire war and also a highly unusual battlefield. Indeed, Harama would prove to be one of the most ideologically and ethnically diverse conflict zones in world history. Along the banks of this Spanish river, it seemed a preview of the coming world war was played out. On the anti-fascist side, the Spanish were joined by thousands of international volunteers drawn from dozens of countries, including the Irish section. They faced some of the best units in the Spanish army. These included the Moroccan regulares, recruited from the Spanish colonies in North Africa, the Spanish Foreign Legion, the Carlist Roquetes, ultra-Catholic militias raised in Navarre, alongside the Nazi Condor Legion, a force sent to Spain by Hitler. The fascist assault across the Harama began on February the 6th in appalling conditions. Indeed, the river was so swollen at times that the attacks had to stop because it was impossible to cross. However, when the fighting started in earnest, the anti-fascist international brigades sustained horrific losses. One recollection of Harama recalled, A, a-, a tank shell burst a few yards away. Across to the left, a a big tank, bigger than any of ours, loomed up. Behind it swarmed moors. Their main fire was on the Spanish company on the left. Simultaneously, the din uh, on the right became terrific. Nothing could live in the face of such fire. The Spaniards stood up to it for a full ten minutes. We had no anti-tank guns, no grenades, no anti-tank material. The left flank broke and the rout spread to the whole line. The slaughter was terrible. One would see five men running abreast and four of them would suddenly crumple up. By mid-February, the fascist onslaught was described as incessant. In the heat of this battle, one Irish man in particular stood out, Christopher Kit Conway. He had already proven himself at La Pera and was an unusual figure in that he had a long and varied military career. He had served in the British Army briefly in 1915 before joining one of the most famous IRA units in the War of Independence, the 3rd Tipperary Brigade. 
Indeed, despite the fact this unit also contained names like Sean Tracy and Dan Breen, one contemporary described Kit Conway as Fearless, a natural-born fighter. I often thought in the subsequent years that had the circumstances afforded him the opportunity, he, he might have become a famous leader like Tom Barry. In the 1920s, Kit had emigrated to America and served several years in the National Guard there. A long-time Republican socialist, he travelled to Spain with Frank Ryan and quickly emerged as one of the best Irish fighters. For those terrified by combat, Kit Conway was a comforting figure. One member of the Irish section remembered, Kit was known and loved by them all. His gallant leadership won them completely. On other fronts, Kit's dashing courage and stern manner had become a a byword with English-speaking volunteers. At the base, he was the centre of every little social gathering with his charismatic love of fun and humour. At Harama, in the intense conflict, Kit Conway would provide indispensable leadership. Another veteran vividly recalled, Kit was standing on top of the hill. He was using his rifle now, and after every shot turned towards the men issuing instructions. However, the randomness and horror of war were immediately apparent when the account continued. I got closer to him. Suddenly, he shouted. His rifle spun out of his hand and he fell back. My God, Kit was hit. I rushed up the hill. Kit was lying across his blankets, somebody dressing him. He was hitting the groin, one of the boys whispered. His eyes were closed, his face pale and drawn. He opened his eyes and he spoke, his voice broken with agony. Boys, don't leave me for the fascists. There was no stretcher, and Kit was gently placed in one improvised from blankets. I was stunned. Kit was gone. We'd never hold on now. And all this time the battle raged on. The Moors had brought us under a heavy flank fire. I could see the fascist tanks toll up on the white road. We would have to retreat now. Kit Conway was killed at Harama, scarcely three months after arriving in Spain, a loss that reinforced to pretty much all of the Irish volunteers any of them could be killed. However, just like Tommy Woods before him, there was little time in that moment to mourn the much-loved Conway. Kit had been killed when he was needed most. There was a very real danger of a total collapse along the Harama front and the fascists could potentially make a major breakthrough. Indeed, in the face of sustained attacks, the line began to buckle and a retreat began. While the Irish had lost one inspirational leader, another now emerged. Frank Ryan had been a leading figure in the brigade, but he had been more on the political side rather than the military end of things. Despite years in the IRA, Ryan had never really seen any major conflict and his military acumen was impeded by the fact that he was partially deaf. However, as the Harama line began to collapse, he stepped forward and rallied the volunteers, leading them back to the front. Ryan would later recall that day. On we marched, back up the road, nearer and nearer to the front. Stragglers still in retreat down the slope stopped in amazement, changed direction and ran to join us. Men lying exhausted on the roadside jumped up, cheered and joined the ranks. This was one of several incidents that helped morale on the line, which was eventually held by the arrival of Russian tanks. While this incident would earn Frank Ryan a reputation for courage and bravery, the level of attrition being suffered by the Irish International Brigades at Harama was unsustainable. Having lost Kit Conway, they would soon lose the man who had filled his place. Scarcely two days after he had led the volunteers back to the front, Frank Ryan was struck by a bullet that had first passed through the skull of the man standing next to him. He would survive but as he described in a letter home, he was taken off the line. I'm off the active list for a while. I got a bullet through the left arm a few days ago on the South Madrid front. It's not serious, and I'm not confined to bed. I kept myself lucky. It was the fourth day of a pretty tough fight, and anyway, I've escaped for a long time, haven't I? However, amidst the carnage of Harama, the International Brigades had successfully held off the attack, which was called off eventually at the end of February. The Irish section had again performed well, but the cost was immense. They were only in the country three months and nearly one in three who had left Ireland in 1936 were dead. After the battle, the Irish anti-fascist volunteers remained on the Harama front. However, General Franco had not given up on the idea of capturing Madrid in early 1937. Having failed to make a breakthrough across the Harama, the other pincer of his overall attack, which was due to strike south across the Guadalajara River, began within days. This would see Ono Duffy's Irish Brigade enter the fray. Much like the anti-fascist volunteers, Ono Duffy's Irish Brigade 
have been desperately in need of military training when they arrived in Spain. However, as we saw in the last episode, the two months they had spent in a training camp in Casieras had been disastrous and dogged by chronic indiscipline. Nevertheless, in spite of all these problems, they were brought into the Harama Valley in mid-February. Their experience there would be very different from that of the anti-fascists and couldn't have gotten off to a worse start. Leaving their training centre at Casieras on February the 17th, they set out for the Harama Front. While they travelled most of the way by train, the final leg of the journey was a lengthy march on foot. Their ultimate destination was the town of Siempozuelos, where they were to occupy a sector of the line. As they made their way on foot towards the town, a column of armed Spaniards appeared ahead of them. Unsure of their purpose, three Irish soldiers and the two Spanish liaison officers with them moved forward. Discussions began, however, once the liaison officers mentioned the fact that they were Irish, something went wrong. The armed Spanish column were unnerved. Alarmed, they opened fire and shot the two Spanish liaison officers dead. The three Irishmen managed to escape back to their line. However, a major firefight broke out, lasting less than an hour before the Spanish column withdrew. In this firefight, two Irishmen, Tom Hyde and Dan Shute, had been killed. This incident has become the focus of much derision when it emerged that the battle had in fact been a friendly fire incident. Given the intensity of the situation around the Harama front, the Spanish column seemed to have thought that O'Duffy's men were in fact anti-fascist because they were English speakers. However, the incident was ultimately due to miscommunication rather than any ineptitude on behalf of the Irish Brigade. It was the Spaniards who had opened fire first. And in any case, friendly fire incidents were common in all wars, not least the Spanish Civil War, where large numbers of inexperienced people who spoke multiple languages fought in the same battlefield. Following this incident, the Irish pushed on to the village of Siempozuelos, on the southern end of the Harama Front, and here the reality of the Spanish Civil War they had heard so much about hit home. On entering the town, they found dead bodies strewn everywhere. Naturally, given the propaganda they had heard in Ireland, and indeed since they had arrived in Spain, they logically assumed that these were victims of anti-fascists. They were, in fact, the garrison of the town, who had been slaughtered by Moroccan regulares when they had taken Siempozuelos. While the Battle of Arama came to an end on February the 27th, the Irish Brigade of Ono Duffy would be involved in manoeuvres to support the offensive that had started on the Guadalajara River, 300 kilometres away. If this was to succeed, the fascists needed to stop reinforcements being taken from the Harama front, so Franco wanted harassing attacks to continue. Therefore, on March the 13th, the Irish Brigade were told to carry out their first assault. The target was a heavily defended position on high ground, protected by machine gun nests dug into cliffs. It has been speculated since that capturing this position was nigh on impossible. The purpose was, however, to hold down the defenders and stop any relief being sent to the Guadalajara front. Predictably, the ensuing attack was a disaster from the perspective of the Irish. As they advanced, they were shelled relentlessly. They never reached their target, and in total, four died, either in the attack or in hospital in the following days. These were John Sweeney, Bernard Hogan and Thomas Foley, along with the Dublin fascist Gabriel Lee. One of Lee's final acts, according to Ono Duffy, was to give a fascist raised arm salute as he lay dying in hospital. Despite the difficult conditions, the Irish were instructed to attack again. However, while O'Duffy wanted to press ahead, his subordinates opposed the move and he realised they simply wouldn't attack. There was no question they would have sustained heavy losses. However, to an extent, this was the point. They needed to tie down the anti-fascists. At this point, their lack of experience and chronic indiscipline came to the fore. O'Duffy refused to attack and instead went to consult Franco himself. What happened next is unclear. O'Duffy said Franco approved of his decision not to attack. However, the Spaniards denied this. Whatever the case, the attack did not go ahead. Whatever doubts the Spaniards had about O'Duffy's Irish Brigade and their limited fighting skills were increasingly confirmed. Four days later, Franco arrived at Siempozuelos on what happened to be St. Patrick's Day. Ono Duffy wasn't present, but Franco found the Irish Brigade celebrating the day, which outraged him. Because of this, a few days later, the Irish Brigade were moved from Siempozuelos to Manzanares, further up the line. While this was an important section, their position was strengthened on either side by Carlists and Moroccan regulares. While this was unfolding, the fascists also suffered a major defeat in their attempt to cross the Guadalajara River and their chance of taking Madrid passed and also with it a quick end to the war. In the following weeks, the Harama front quietened down and this created major problems for the Irish brigades. 
In many ways, it's easiest to maintain discipline in the heat of battle. However, most armies struggle in periods of less intense conflict. In this context, whatever discipline existed in O'Duffy's Irish Brigade now collapsed. The conditions they were facing were appalling. Disease was rampant, something that was exacerbated by the fact they were totally unprepared for the conditions they faced. A Castlecomber member of the brigade, Joseph Doyle, had been informed before he left Ireland to bring a heavy overcoat, a pair of breeches, one pair of boots, three pairs of heavy socks, one spare set of underwear, a belt, a pouch of ammunition and a shaving kit and nothing else. This was hopelessly inadequate. In these difficult conditions, O'Duffy and his officers argued amongst themselves. There were reports of open fist fights while O'Duffy himself showed no leadership and spent increasing amounts of time in hotels in Salamanca. When Colonel Yagwe of the Foreign Legion, who had long been dubious about Owen O'Duffy, turned up unannounced at Manzanares to inspect the Irish Brigade on March the 24th, he was horrified by what he found. Discipline was now at rock bottom. Soldiers were drunk in the trenches. Some were threatening their superiors with violence. Yagwe concluded that they undermined the security of the entire line and he wrote the following report to Franco. The military efficiency of this unit is absolutely nil. For all these reasons, I consider it a danger because the stretch of the front they occupy in attack or defence will never be safe. And I think it would be convenient to dissolve it and distribute it among the other brigades for those who want to stay and, for the rest, repatriate them. Initially, Franco did nothing. He was extremely busy trying to organise another attack after the failure of the Guadalajara. However, it was Ono Duffy himself who accelerated the process of the Irish Brigade's demise. On April the 9th, he wrote to Franco stating that the Irish Brigade should in fact be returned to Ireland. His reason was because his command was collapsing and he now feared if he stayed much longer, he would lose face. He was also increasingly looking to intervene in politics back in Ireland. When the volunteers of the Irish Brigade heard this, it precipitated a major row between the Spanish liaison officers attached to the brigade, those loyal to O'Duffy, and a third group disaffected with O'Duffy's leadership. These disputes would reach a chronic level. One of the most grave incidents saw an Irish officer, Dermot O'Sullivan, tell a Spanish officer he was going home to Ireland and then he would return to fight on the anti-fascist side. O'Sullivan was later arrested and imprisoned for this outburst. If he was Spanish, he probably would have been executed. Meanwhile, negotiations began to try and ease the situation and find a solution to keep the brigade in Spain. One suggestion was that the Irish brigade would be dissolved and sent to other units. O'Duffy, however, point-blank refused this, given it would be humiliating for him. Ultimately, these attempts at mediation failed because Owen O'Duffy refused to budge on any of the concessions demanded of the Irish. It seems he had made up his mind to return to Ireland because elections were due to be held in the summer of 1937. Manny had suspected that O'Duffy had always had one eye on resurrecting his failed political career in Ireland through a successful intervention in Spain. He had envisaged himself returning to Ireland a hero and possibly capitalising on this in the forthcoming elections. Franco had also realised this. Leopold Kearney, the Irish ambassador in Spain, informed the Irish government in a letter on June the 8th, 1937, that Franco and his brother had come to this assessment. Nicholas Franco and General Franco had now sized up O'Duffy who they considered bluffed much and promised much while delivering little. They believed that his desire to return to Ireland is prompted by the approach of the general election. The Irish Brigade's intervention was clearly at an end. On June the 17th, they left Spain for Ireland. They were leaving seven dead, buried in Spanish graveyards, while another 20 remained in Spain, six in hospital and a further 14 who had enlisted in the Spanish Foreign Legion as individuals. Three days after their departure, they arrived at the North Wall Pier in Dublin. From there, they marched into the city centre. Considerable numbers greeted them, although probably not the 10,000 O'Duffy claimed. The wider Irish public at the time had little knowledge of the scale of the debacle. No one involved, from O'Duffy to Franco, had an interest in publicising it. However, amidst the celebrations of their homecoming, there were some signs of the acrimony that had dogged their experience in Spain. The brigade had split up on the pier in Dublin with three factions marching away separately. If O'Duffy's ultimate aim had been to influence the Irish election in that summer of 1937, he failed in this endeavour. Having arrived in Ireland on June the 20th, the election was held less than three weeks later, intervening in an election in Ireland where there was an array of extremely conservative candidates would never have been easy. Doing so in the space of three weeks was impossible. Meanwhile, back in Spain, the war was far from over for the Irish anti-fascists in the international brigades. 
There's little doubt they had acquitted themselves far better than Owen O'Duffy's Irish Brigade though. The reasons for these different experiences have been the subject of much debate over the last 80 years. However, the answers are far from straightforward. Ultimately, the two groups were drawn from the same country and aside from a few exceptional cases, neither had any experience of conventional warfare. There has been a tendency to write off the men who followed Ono Duffy to Spain as somehow lesser because they fought for fascism. This explains little though. It would be a mistake to think that most who supported Franco did not believe in the righteousness of their cause, even if it seems repugnant today. When we strip it down, there are numerous reasons why the groups fared so differently. Ideological cohesion probably played a role in terms of discipline. Those who travelled to Spain to fight for Franco came from various backgrounds, from Catholics and Conservatives to a core of ideological fascists. All that unified them was a religious outlook and a dislike of communism. They shared little with the Spanish army they fought alongside and ultimately Franco's victory was not really a victory for Ono Duffy or the Irish Brigade. Conversely, the anti-fascists shared a socialist republican outlook on the world. The internationalism of this ideology meant that a victory for the Spanish anti-fascist movement was a victory for them too. Furthermore, these people had little to return home to, save further vilification for their beliefs, while many of O'Duffy's men expected a hero's welcome. However, the key issue appears to have been one of leadership. Owen O'Duffy was completely unable and unsuitable for the task at hand. An alcoholic, he had a vastly inflated sense of his military experience and importance. He not only failed to establish discipline, but even the respect of considerable numbers of his own men. While Owen O'Duffy's return to Ireland in June 1937 brought an end to Irish military involvement on the fascist side, save for a handful of individuals, this did not end Irish involvement. As we will see in episode 9, others, particularly Aileen O'Brien, would have a major impact on the fascist cause later in the war. Meanwhile, in the next episode, we will see the conflict change dramatically. Franco had failed to take Madrid in four successive attempts, and in the spring of 1937, he adopted a new strategy. Large numbers of his troops were tied down surrounding the anti-fascist zone of the Basque country, Asturias and Cantabria, along the north coast. He would now try and crush this region and free up those troops. The next episode, therefore, brings us on to something known as the War in the North, where the most notorious event in the Spanish Civil War took place. This is the bombing of Guernica, immortalised by Pablo Picasso's painting. The destruction of Guernica would have profound consequences across the world, not least in Ireland. That's all coming in the next episode, out next Monday. Don't forget to check out the new shop at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. That's irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. Until next time... Sloan.